This is the lecture for Ancient and Medieval History for Friday, the 10th of December, 2021. Um, like I said, Ancient and Medieval History. So, the war begins between the Lion of Sparta and the Tiger Shark of Athens. Corsaira is the pretext, but the reality is the fight is much more basic. On the one hand, you've got the question. You've got two alpha predators in the paddock. Who's the real alpha? you got two bullies in the playground. Who's the bestest, baddest bully? So there's that. The Godzilla versus King Kong question. Who would win? But in a more serious vein, this war is about the same thing that all wars are about, in addition to their other pretexts. And that is the future. Anxiety about what will happen in the future. Practically, the Athenians and the Spartans have very little to fight over. But the question, will that enemy inevitably continue growing in power until our descendants will end up uh, being ruled by their descendants? That's an unanswerable question that uh, is addressed through war. If we can't be sure of the future, what we can be sure to do is make sure that while we have the army or the navy now, we can fight. Let's not wait for some inevitable future of doom Let's fight while we have the capability of possibly winning. So the Peloponnesian War, this 27-year long struggle, begins. And <laughs> it produces stalemate. There's a little bit of fighting around the edges. The Spartans take Amphipopolis, for example. The Athenians take some Spartan allies who are on islands or on the coast. But in general terms, the Spartan army marches to Athens and camps around Athens, besieging it. But the Athenians have their snorkel, the long walls, that allow them to breathe in resources from their empire and exhale power. Piraeus, the long walls in Athens, remain proof against Spart Sparta's army. The Athenians control the seas, the Spartans control the mainland, and it's very hard for the two sides to get at one another. But then, doom comes in the form of a plague. The Athenians are all close together inside their city. They are not eating as well as they were used to because they're basically being rationed food because it all has to come by ship through Piraeus and the Long Walls. For that reason, or because, as Homer would say, the Olympians decided to take sides, Athens is hit with a plague. Do we know what disease? No. What we know was... Just drop the pass on my desk and welcome what we know is that it was virulent, it had a high communicability rate, and it had a high mortality rate. And historically, when you have a plague that is virulent, highly communicable, and highly lethal, we call it plague. Pericles himself is killed in this plague. So the Athenian ability to aggressively and energetically wage war is going to be trammeled by, limited by, the fact that the Athenian population has been winnowed down by disease. Still, Athens and Sparta fight on, but inconclusively. The Spartans because of their dictatorship, because of the nature of their militarized society, is much more morally capable, as well as being less affected by the plague, of waging a long war than Athens. The Athenians 
don't like the privations. They don't like the constant worry. They don't like the fact that just across that narrow wave of stone are tens of thousands of very effective killers who want everyone I love dead or enslaved. So the Athenians become war weary. The last time Americans were truly war weary was in the early 1970s, late in the Vietnam War. In our country, the war weariness took a variety of forms. There were violent protests in the streets intended to provoke violence. They did. Sometimes the forces of law and order actually fired into the crowd. At Kent State University in Ohio, four students were killed in the midst of one of these provocations, one of these demonstrations, by National Guardsmen who aren't professional soldiers, who aren't professional police. They were called up because the violence had gotten so bad on campus that something needed to be done. The truth is, one of the most difficult operations for any paramilitary or military organization is crowd control, when you're dealing with a crowd that practices techniques designed to provoke you. Why would a crowd provoke armed response? Because it looks bad in the press. It looks bad on television. It delegitimizes what law and order stands for. And if you are a revolutionary out to change society and end a war, then if a few people on your side are martyred, so be it. At, it was at this time that a soldier coming home from combat in Southeast Asia wearing their uniform would be met by protesters at Los Angeles International Airport and spat upon, called baby killers. For years, College students who were anti-war would try to seduce the girlfriends of soldiers who were overseas to demoralize them. This was this 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 wasn't this is not a conspiracy theory. They actually said this openly. Because if you can take a girlfriend away from a soldier overseas, you can demoralize him, and that'll make it better for the heroic people's army of communist uh, Vietnam to win the war. There were riots in the streets. There were neighborhoods that burned down. Everyone was angry at everyone. It was worse then than it is now. And in Athens, it was the same. Everyone was upset. But being a democracy, what happened was that the Athenians began acting erratically. Yeah, there were riots, sure. But they began replacing their leaders the moment that the leader didn't please the mob. It takes time to learn how to be a leader, especially in a democracy where nobody is allowed to be a leader for too long. But they would replace generals who ran the war and ran the country during war every few months. Oh, let's, this, this guy is, who's in office, he's awful. Let's get a new guy. And the new guy is in there for just a little while. He hasn't really learned the ropes yet. And, oh, this new guy, he's, he's just as bad or worse. Let's get rid of him and put somebody else in. So the Athenian leadership is taking headshots and body blows from their own people. Because their own people aren't happy with anything. Because they are war-weary. They want the war to end, but they don't want to lose. And they're not willing to do what's necessary to win. Or are they? A young Greek general named Alcibiades, a fire and brimstone orator, proposes a bold plan to win the war. You see... One of Sparta's allies is the city of Syracuse, far away on the island of Sicily. Syracuse is as wealthy as Athens. Syracuse has a navy 
almost as powerful, or maybe even more powerful than Athens. And Syracuse is helping Sparta continue the war. But we have sea power, Alcibiades says. What we should do <laughs> is we should put all our effort into one heroic thrust and launch a massive amphibious invasion of Sicily with the goal of conquering Syracuse. If we conquer Syracuse, we add the power of Syracuse to ours, we add the fleet of Syracuse to ours, we add the manpower of Syracuse to ours, and that could be enough to tip the balance and win the war. It's a bold idea. There are others, though, that call it folly, that say that what this will do is this will lead to defeat. But a war-weary population is just desperate enough to try this out. So, the Athenians build a massive fleet and load it up with massive numbers of troops, most of their reserves, and they row and sail and land near Syracuse. Syracuse has walls like Athens. They're big, very hard to fight. So the Athenians build a series of fortifications outside of Syracuse. They don't invade the city. Let's say this is the coast of Syracuse. And here is the city of Syracuse. What the Athenians do, show you which is the water, is the Athenians have their fleet blockade Syracuse and they build a series of trench works and walls around Syracuse. So the Athenian army is besieging Syracuse a lot the way, like the way the Spartan army is besieging Athens. This defeats the whole purpose of a quick gamble to win. But once they get to Syracuse, the commanders don't see any possibility of Athens defeating the walls. This isn't good. And then, <laughs> the allies of Syracuse and the rest of Sicily, they surround the Athenians and build a series of walls out here. And their fleets come and they're at least fighting against the Athenian fleet. So the Athenians are this thin layer of Athens between the city of Syracuse and the allies of Syracuse. It's like a donut with a bite taken out of it. That's the Athenian position. It's not a good position. What to do? Well, there's one last bit of reserves in Athens. Yeah. In for a penny. In for a pound. Let's go. So the politicians, the generals, Alcibiades' faction, convinces the Athenians to take their last breath of vitality, their last reserves, and send relief forces to Syracuse. So a second fleet with a second army is sent to Syracuse. They land. There's fleet actions. There are land actions and the Athenians are roundly defeated. With the Athenian defeat at Syracuse, it's more than a defeat. It's a debacle. It's, it's a disaster from an Athenian point of view. It really, 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 really is. Sparta wins the war. Athens surrenders. Okay. Athens must demolish their long walls, which they do. Athens must give up their empire, which they do. Athens is going to, from this point, become a sleepy university town, which it does. Athens is no longer one of the potential rulers of Greece. They are brought low, but they're not destroyed, and the people of Athens are not enslaved en masse. They're too far away for Sparta. 
So Athens is basically <clears throat> reduced to a political backwater. Culturally, it's still, mm, but it's a political and military backwater. <clears throat> Sparta is now hegemon, overlord of Greece. Based on what I've told you of Sparta, based on what you know, how important is ruling Greece to the Spartans compared to their other priorities? I say, yeah. Because with the Spartans, it's always their slaves. Their slaves, their slaves, always their slaves. They don't have the attention. They don't have the interest. They really are not interested in being the overlords of Greece. Not enough to do it right. So there's Thebes, which is not only a city in Egypt, it's also a city in Greece. And other cities begin to rise up, and they unseat Sparta as, as, as hegemon. And for the next 80 years or so, they fight. And fight, and fight, and fight, and fight. Fight, 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 fight. The Greek city-states do not accept anyone. In fact, just like the Athenians were war-weary, <laughs> The Greeks become embittered against one another to such an extent that they're not going to get behind anyone because they won't accept it. One of the best things that had been true of the United States is that you fight hard during the election. But then after the election, you come together, at least for a little while, give the winner a honeymoon period, and then go and fight them again. That's the American way. In 1960, the election between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy was so close, and there was so much evidence of dead people voting in huge numbers in Chicago and the state of Texas for Kennedy, that... There were a lot of people that encouraged uh, Vice, at that time he was Vice President Nixon, to challenge the results. Nixon said, no, it would be bad for the country. The communist Russians would benefit from our disorder. And he conceded the election to John F. Kennedy. Nixon became president eight years later, but that's a different story. Kennedy became president. Nixon didn't want to challenge the results. He didn't want to rip the country apart. Now flash forward to the year 2000. There's another razor-thin election between Democrat Al Gore and Republican George W. Bush, the second of the Bushes. This time, Al Gore decides that he's going to contest the results. But not everywhere, just in one state, Florida. And not in the entire state, just in a few hand-picked counties that are strongly Democrat. Hmm. This goes on from early November until mid-December. I remember Thanksgiving of 2000, having arguments with family members over this. It was not good. The country was embittered. Finally, the Supreme Court said it's unreasonable to do a selective recount of votes just in some Democrat counties. If you had asked for a recount for the entire state, that would have been different. So, George W. Bush is President of the United States, which was kind of important since 9-11 happened just a few months later. 2016, the media, the uh, university elites, and others just assumed that Hillary Clinton would become President of the United States, but she didn't. Instead of graciously conceding Hillary Clinton bitterly conceded, and a campaign rumor that her campaign paid for and started that Donald Trump was a Russian agent became an excuse for the next four years to have congressional investigations and all sorts of questions about whether Trump was in fact a stooge of Vladimir Putin. 
all of this made it harder for Americans to give Trump a honeymoon period. He never got a honeymoon period. There were people who were just as bitter to him after the election as before because she chose to do what she did. This year, it's coming out that the only evidence involved in this was evidence that this evidence w that Hillary used was bought and paid for by her own people. That's not valid. In 2020, because of the Wuhan flu pandemic, instead of using our normal voting procedures, states improvised. The fear was that people wouldn't be able to vote in person because of the COVID restrictions. That if we had everyone vote in person, like normal, except for those few people who need absentee ballots, that it would make the pandemic worse. But instead, in some states anyway, instead of saying to everyone who's at home, okay, you've got to apply for an absentee ballot, which isn't very hard, I've done it. Some cities, some counties, and some states just looked at um, the tax rolls or looked at the, looked at the census figures or looked at the Postal Service address book and mailed ballots out blindly to people. That, that, that won't go wrong. There, there won't be voter fraud there if you just mail ballots to people who you think exist but have no reason to, you know, there's no guarantee that even if they do exist that they still live there or that they... The potential for voter fraud was high. And therefore, people like myself, while not being in the streets fighting against Biden's accession to the presidency sincerely doubt the validity of the election. It's poisonous. It's poisonous not to fight and then come together. Fight and then come together. That's the way it should be. And for a variety of reasons, that's become less and less common. Instead, we fight and then we fight and then we fight some more. Looking at this from the north, is the king of Macedon, Philip. Now, Macedon isn't Greece. Just ask any Greek. Even today, Macedon is not considered Greece. Now, there are rumors that the Greek tell, Greeks tell about Macedonians as the big, hairy-chested barbarians who are so virile that every goat north of uh, Thessaly must watch out for themselves. I mean, it's vulgar, but it's, it's what people say and said. The Macedonians were considered barbarians. But Philip sees in Greece such division, such hatred from one Greek to another, that he sees an opportunity. Philip also has mastered the Greek form of warfare with hoplites. But he decides to make his units twice as big, and his hoplite spears, not seven feet long like the Greeks, but 14 feet long. <laughs> and then Philip marches south. The Macedonian army finds a Greece so divided that the foreign conqueror is actually welcomed in many quarters. Because, yes, he may be a goat loving savage, but at least he's not some bleep from Corinth. The Greeks have come to hate each other so much that they would rather have a foreign overlord because at least then they're all equally under the boot or the sandal of the foreign overlord. But they didn't wear boots. <laughs> you know when else this happened? France, 1940. The beginning of World War II. The French don't want to be in World War II. <laughs> they, they really don't. Because the French don't hate the Germans yet. That changes. They, they, they sort of hate the Germans as a reflex, you know. But what they really hate is they hate each other. Socialist Frenchmen hate the aristocrats and the middle class. The middle class fear the socialists and hate the aristocrats. The aristocrats have contempt for the so middle class, the businessmen, and, and for the socialists. The French are really a divided nation, worse than we are now. And when the German attack comes, 
The soldiers, many of whom are socialists, won't even salute, let fight for their officers. In many cases, the units are so divided from each other that they're ineffective. Also, the French choose an octogenarian, that's 80 year old commander, who decides to command the battle from a chateau dozens of miles from the nearest front that has no radio. Because he thinks radios are uncouth. So the French commander does all his business through couriers on motorcycles and occasional telephone calls. That's not going to come back and bite the French. So France ends up being defeated in six weeks in 1940. They, had, they weren't defeated by the Germans for four and a half years of combat 20 years before. But now, six weeks. Why? Among other reasons, uh, don't choose an 80-year-old commander who doesn't like radios in, in World War II. That might work in Napoleon's time, doesn't work in World War II. And uh, if you hate your fellow countrymen more than you hate foreign attackers, that's bad. That's bad. I never want to see America so divided that we have people happier to be under the rule of the Chinese or the Russians or the Mexicans or pick your, you know, whoever. The Canadians. Um, <laughs> you, follow our rules, eh? Um, <laughs> the nicest conquerors ever, at least the most polite. I would not want that. I would not want that. Um, a country divided its, against itself cannot stand. Lincoln, Lincoln said that. A house divided against itself cannot stay. So, uh, Greece is conquered by the Macedonians, by Philip of Macedon. Now, <laughs> Philip understands a few things. First of all, um, he understands that Greece wasn't just deeply embittered, it was bled white by their constant civil wars. What does it mean to be bled white? Well, this is an expression that comes from World War I, and it was used by both the French and the Germans as to what they're going to do to one another. If you have somebody who has an arterial wound, which means blood spurting across the room pss, 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 at high pressure, that's bad. They're going to lose blood fast. You've got to put a tourniquet on that wound, or they're going to die. So you put a tourniquet on that wound, but they've lost so much blood, it doesn't matter what ethnic group they are. The skin is going to be more close to the color of paper than whatever their natural skin tone is. That's what it means to be bled white. It is a bad thing. If you ever see flesh that looks like white paper, something's going on. <laughs> Stop. You're still pink. <laughs> You're still a pink skin. Um, you know, white people are, are pink skins. Japanese uh, describe themselves as being the color of wheat, which is an interesting way of putting it. Um, and it's true, actually. Uh, the Japanese aren't wrong. So, I get pink skins from Star Trek. They had these blue-skinned aliens <laughs> called Andorians who called the humans pink skins, which really made the African-American uh, cast members happy, I'm sure, as happy as a black kid opening up a box of crayons and seeing flesh color or skin oh. color. <laughs> and it's, it's the color of, you know, white people's skin. There are skits about that. <laughs> oh, look, I'm a conservative, but I'm honest. <laughs> That's a little bit racist. <laughs> not, it's not nasty racist, it's just unconsciously racist. Maybe systemically, I don't know, never mind. In any case, um, Philip understands that uh, he needs to um, unify Greece, not just uh, under his rule passively, but behind a cause. There has to be something that will make the Greeks excited enough to come together, like they did back in those Persian War days. And then something happens. A group of Greek mercenaries, 10,000 of them, are hired by one of the later King Darius's of Persia to go into Persia and be his bully boys and put down rebellions. Why is the Persian great king hiring Greeks? Because Greeks are the toughest hombres on the battlefield at that time. That's why. So you get 10,000 soldiers for hire, 10,000 mercenaries, and they, if they work loyally for the king, you don't mess with the king. Otherwise, they'll kill you until you're dead, um, which is the best way to kill someone if you're going to do that. 
But then that king dies. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> In fact, he dies under suspicious circumstances, and um, everyone suspects that the Greeks killed him. In fact, the people who killed the king made it look like the Greeks did it. So now the Greeks, these 10,000, are near Tessaphon in Babylon in the heart of the Persian Empire. And they've got to make their way back to Greece through Persian territory, Persian territory, Persian territory, Persian territory, Persian territory, and then finally cross over to Greece. One of the 10,000 was a man named Xenophon, who tells the story in a book called The Anabasis. In The Anabasis, the 10,000 have to fight their way home against all sorts of Persian enemies. It's a great story. Back in 1980, I think it was, they decided to adapt the Anabasis to New York City street gangs, and they made a movie called The Warriors. It's a weird movie, and it's very violent, so, you know, see it when you're of an age to, to, to see that sort of thing. But The Warriors is about a queen street gang that has to travel over 100 miles north to the Bronx to take part in a parlay. And the guy, the gang leader who called the parlay gets assassinated, and some guy, the guy who did it, says, The Warriors did it! The Warriors did it! And so the Warriors end up getting targeted by everyone as they fight their way home. It ends with a famous scene where the actual assassin who said, The Warriors did it, is driving through Coney Island's amusement park with three beer bottles on his fingers going, Cling, 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 cling. Warriors, come out to play! It was just creepy. It shows you how creepy the movie is. It's a gang movie about gang violence. It's not going to be pretty. And he, he dies. Spoiler alert. Um, see the movie when you're older. In any event, this is this is all this is this is except for the bottles. Uh, sort of what happens to the ten thousand? <laughs> and Philip looks at this and says, "Hmm. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that if the Persian Empire can't stop ten thousand Greeks from escaping from its heartland." all the way home. They're pretty bleeping weak. They're weaker than we thought. Greeks, I call you together on a great quest. We will march each east and attack Persia. And he gets assassinated. Just as he calls Greece together on their great crusade eastward, he gets assassinated. <laughs> And the assassins think, okay, this is going to be cool. We're going to rule. It's going to be great. Well, what about his heirs? His heirs is a teenage pipsqueak named Alex. Who cares about Alex? He's a, he's a schlub. He's, well, you know, we'll, we'll either dominate him or we'll kill him too. <laughs> Did not know who they were messing with. Because the son of Philip is known to history as Alexander the Great. And he isn't called the Great because he's easily messed with by assassins. Alexander, as a young man, is, has as one of his tutors the philosopher Aristotle, who is one of the three great philosophers of ancient Greece. So he's got a good teacher. And more than that, Alexander has two qualities that are shared only by one other man in all of human history in the way that Alexander has it, and that's Napoleon Bonaparte. Alexander, when he was younger than you, commands men in battle. And he's good at it. So when his father is assassinated, Alexander grabs the reins of government, has the assassins arrested, and they're all killed. They're all executed. And then Alexander says, In memory of my beloved father, and for the greater glory of Greece, we shall march east and conquer Persia! <laughs> no assassin see. Persia! So Alexander marshals this grand army of Greece that's going to pay Persia back for Thermopylae and Marathon and all of that. Alexander moves into the Persian Empire inexorably. There are battles like at Issus where the Persians try to fight him and he crushes them and marches at will deep into Persia. Occasionally a Persian army fights him. Alexander goes to here as part of his struggle 
And there's a city here called Gordium. Gordium is um, famous because it has a tourist attraction. There's this famous knot of cabled rope. And this knot is something that philosophers and scientists and, and great thinkers and generals and gamers, you know, gamers, Greek gamers, they go to Gordium. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm, what if we did this? It's like the Rubik's Cube of their time. And uh, nobody can figure it out. <laughs> so Alexander the Great, as his army is passing by, says, hey, we're in the area. Let's stop at Gordium. So his army marches up to Gordium, and the people of Gordium come out and, yay! Because he's got an army, Alexander the Great does. And if he has an army, he'd better be happy with us. Because if he's not happy with us, the army will then kill us to death, <laughs> which we don't want. Yay! So Alexander rides up very heroically and uh, of course, they take him to the knot because you know everyone knows that's what he's there to see. And Alexander gets down off his horse, looks at it from all sides. Slice and cuts the knot asunder, cuts it in twain, cuts it in two. Slice. And the knot falls down, and he puts his sword back, uh, and he resheathes it and says, good, we're done here. Let's move on. A and the people of Gordium, who've just lost their only claim to fame, who've just lost their tourist attraction, who've just lost any reason for people to come and spend money in Gordium, who now are going to be suffering, go, yay! Because he's got an army. That's the kind of guy Alexander the Great is, which is a lesson for everyone. Sometimes in life, you've just got to cut through the BS, the red tape, the silly rules that people think are so important. Sometimes in life, you've got to, oh God, I hate this expression, think outside the box. <laughs> Sorry, the box is my skull. If I think outside of it, my brain is doing something it really shouldn't do. <laughs> but there are times in life where people try to trap you, but not with chains or ropes, but... Instead, with ideas, you can't do this. You got to do it that way. Oh, yeah, you got to. No, slice. <laughs> Sometimes in life, you just got to cut through it. And Alexander knows this. And he marches on. <laughs> now, what are Alexander's qualities? Well, here, here are the qualities that, again, only Napoleon shares in quite the same way. First of all, Alexander has a natural talent to read the ground of a battlefield. Now, any competent land commander can do this, but not like Alexander. Alexander can look at an area of hills, you've got hills in the distance, and you've got uh, forests, and you've got a river. Really? And... Uh, you know, you got a swamp. And most commanders can spot a few things. But what Alexander the Great can do is he can look at that battlefield and just see in his mind the way the enemy will move. What they will use as cover, how they will think. In fact, by looking at the land and looking at the way the enemy commander deploys his troops, Alexander the Great can actually discern the mind of his enemy commander. He can figure out the psychological weaknesses, the assumptions, the fears. Like looking at somebody's signature or like some at somebody's art, a good analysis or analyst from, say, the FBI can say, oh, this person has these tendencies. How can you tell? I looked at their signature. I've studied handwriting analysis. You know, it's, it's not a perfect science, but it's likely that I'm right. And it usually is. You look at somebody's art, the way they draw, what they choose to focus on. You can get a sense of their psychology. Well, Alexander the Great can do this by looking at the land and looking at the way the enemy deploys. So he has a great sense for the land, but that's not all. 
He has a great sense for the enemy's psychological proclivities. But that's not all. He also has a deep understanding of how his own people think. And he is capable of understanding at what moments you need to support your commanders. Okay, you screwed up, but I know you were trying, and I know why you did it. Just learn from the experience. That's one way of dealing with it. Another way of dealing with it is, uh, oh, this commander's overconfident. He's being lazy at this moment. Hey, what do you think you're doing? This is actually serious stuff. You know, it's war. Wake up. Alexander knows when to use the carrot, when to use the stick, and how to get his men motivated and loyal to the point where his officers and his soldiers would literally be willing to march into hell rather than disappoint him. And I'll be explaining exactly what I mean by that next class. So Alexander the Great has these abilities to read the land and to read the people around him, both the enemy commander and his own people. And he uses these insights to become incredibly successful in battle. I mean incredibly, incredibly successful in battle. He never loses a battle. Napoleon never loses a battle until the very last battle that he fights. Uh, well, he, he loses a couple. Uh, but uh, except for Waterloo, it's because of overwhelming force being leveled against him. And because he's gotten old and because he's done it for like 20 years. After 20 years of fighting battles, sooner or later you're going to have a bad day. Alexander never has one. So... Now we come to Alexander arriving in the heart of the Persian Empire near Tessaphon and Babylon, arriving at a place called Gaugamea. At Gaugamea, the main force of uh, the Persians, please close the shades. <laughs> Dan, you can delegate that if you want. Okay. At Galgamia, hoorah! Alexander the Great meets the main army of King Darius of Persia, one of the later Darius. And in this battle, the Persians have these massive formations of troops with cavalry, cavalry, and the great king is here. The Athenians have much smaller numbers. And we have Alexander's cavalry, which is here. Not the Athenians, the Greeks, the Macedonians. But what somebody points out is that the ground is oddly level. In this region of the battlefield. Almost like it's been swept and shoveled. So that it's smooth. And um, hmm, there are chariots here. So Alexander discerns that the Persians are going to attack with their chariots, but that they're not going to attack straight across. Instead, that they're going to do an echelon attack, which is sort of an attack across the enemy sideways. Alexander marshals his forces, hits the Persians where they aren't, and uh, is going to confuse the Persians. I'll need lights in a moment, but not just yet. There is a famous mosaic of this battle You can shut the lights off now, please. Okay. 
see this is a good image. Obviously, it's 2,200, 2,300 years later, so there's been damage to it. Really? Okay, there we go. Good. So here's the whole mosaic. And you can already see a few things. You can see Alexander in an attack against Cyrus of Persia, I'm sorry, uh, against one of the later Dariuses of Persia. And obviously there are parts missing. And what's the king of Persia doing? Well, he's running away. Alexander personally leads a charge of his companion cavalry right at the heart of the Persian lines. After misdirecting the Persians all over the place, he goes right for this guy. And this guy panics. The king rides away from his army in the middle of a battle. So let's take a closer look at the people involved. So here's Alexander. Still a young man. Late 20s, early 30s. With a <coughs> big nose! And a spear ready to go after the Persian king and throw it at him, which it does, actually. And here is the Persian great king in his chariot going away, and the fear in the eyes of these men is real. Now, who were the, um, the people that Alexander personally led? They were called the Companions. The Companions were a group of cavalry. Now, again, in the ancient world, until the very end of the Roman Empire, cavalry were at a weak, in a weak position because nobody had stirrups. So, do you get the lights again, please? Because nobody had stirrups, you're riding a horse, with your lance or your spear, and you're going to hit an enemy somewhere. Yeah! Well, you don't have stirrups. So what's as likely to happen is you getting lifted off your horse and thrown behind it and dropped on the ground, like Wile E. Coyote, super genius, facing the roadrunner. Yeah! Wait! And there you are on the ground, ready to be killed by your enemy. It's only when stirrups are developed that a knight can stand up and go in the stirrups, yeah, and actually kill and have a reasonable chance of, of not falling off the horse or dying himself. But even with this, Alexander is able to do a very good job with horsemen. Because these horsemen are the most motivated. This is how he does it. The companions have a left side partner and a right side partner, an older soldier paired with a younger soldier, and they are paired as homosexual lovers. They may have wives back home, they may like the women elsewhere, but they are expected to love one another in that manner. On the belief that men who are lovers will fight more fiercely for each other than any other kind of man. This is not a theory shared by most armies, but it is something that's very particular to Alexander. He personally led the companion's cavalry, so he obviously had a pair-bound lover. What is true is, whatever the theory behind it, these guys were tough, tough hombres on the battlefield. Next time, Monday... Uh, I plan on showing you a film reproduction reproduction of the Battle of Galgamia, the critical battle in the Greco in the uh, uh, wars of Alexander to conquer the Persian Empire. Have a good vacation or not wait, vacation? Have a good weekend. Thanks. Vacation is a week from today, starting. But any questions, comments, or thoughts? Okay, thank you.